as we move forward. In Proverbs chapter 1, though, I do believe this is one of the strongest Proverbs, one of the best ones. A lot of my favorite Proverbs come out of other chapters, but there's just so much groundwork that's being laid here, especially in the first few verses. I believe the first seven. If you look at verse number seven, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And listen, today in America, what we're surrounded by is a bunch of fools that despise God's Word. They don't want to be instructed in what's right according to God. They don't want knowledge of godliness. They don't want God's wisdom in their life. And they're reaping what they sow. Their life is a mess. Their family is a mess. Their mind is polluted. And it's because they've not hearkened unto the Word of God. And that phrase that he used there, the fear of the Lord, is found in several places just in Proverbs. But the title of the sermon tonight, I think a phrase that would sum up this entire chapter, is the fear of the Lord is the beginning. How do you start as a Christian now that you're saved, now that you want to grow? It better start with some fear of Almighty God that He will judge your life if you're going in the wrong direction. He will correct you. He will chastise you. He will put a curse on your blessings if you refuse to hearken to His words. But listen, if you, if you take heed to what's written here, God will give you a blessing. He'll give you more understanding. He'll make you more fruitful in all aspects of your life. So it starts with some fear of the Lord. And there are people out there that scoff at the Bible for that one reason. They don't want to be afraid of their Lord. But you know what? In the night terrors, in their own heart, they truly are afraid. They know the truth. They're afraid of their destiny. They're afraid of eternity. And if they would just be afraid now, then maybe they could, you know, hey, the fear of the Lord, salvation begins, I believe, with the fear of the Lord. You've got to humble yourself and be afraid of the judgment of God that hell is real. Amen. We're responsible for our actions. Look at verse number 1. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. The Proverbs. The, this phrase, Proverbs, is used in several places in the Bible. I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. Keeping your finger here, we're going to look at how he received these Proverbs, why it is he has the Proverbs of wisdom. And remember, Jesus spoke about the wisdom of Solomon. In Luke 11, he says, The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the utmost part of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here Jesus is reminding us of the importance of the wisdom of Solomon even the Queen of the South got saved from listening to the wisdom of Solomon and we have the Proverbs of Solomon completed we have this wisdom that God has chosen to give us and hey Solomon had Proverbs but Jesus said there's a greater one here right Jesus had his Proverbs Jesus had his parables Jesus has given us even more beyond the Proverbs, but I think Jesus makes the point. He's speaking to a crowd that says, you should know these Proverbs. That's a foundation. This is a beginning point. So as Christians, let's make sure that we know the Proverbs. We're willing to let God correct us when we're wrong, receive this instruction, because there is an importance to the wisdom that God gave to Solomon. and basically says there wasn't anybody greater than him up until Jesus. You're in 1 Kings chapter 3. Look at verse number 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared unto Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give to thee. Wow, what, what, wouldn't that be cool? God came to you and said, What do you want? Anything. Name it. I'll give it to you. Now Solomon, in, his, in the wisdom that he had, in the humility that he already had, look how he answers in verse number 7. And now, O Lord my God, Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. Look, he's very humble at this point. He is very humble. He's saying, God, before you, I am but a little child. Look, he was king. He was king over one of the greatest kingdoms at this time. He was the big dog on the scene, and what did he do before God? He humbled himself. He said, God, who am I? Who am I before you? He wasn't puffed up about his own ability. He was giving God credit for giving him the position that he had. And he humbly asked God for more wisdom. Look at verse number 9. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this 
Thy so great a people. So he says, look, I need understanding. I need to be able to discern in judgment. This is one of the essential purposes of wisdom, is that so we can judge things, so we can discern things, so we can understand what is right, what is wrong. We can make a shot call when we need, when somebody says, hey, what would the Bible say about this? Well, I know what the Bible says. Hey, what do I do in this situation in my life? Without the wisdom of God, you're, more, you're gonna make the wrong decision. You're not going to have that discernment, that godly discernment. And, you know, discernment is understanding judgment, having the wisdom to judge right. That's what, that's what Solomon's asking for. Lord, I'm supposed to judge your people. Help me to judge them rightly. Give me the discernment to do it the right way. Look at verse 10. And the speech pleased the Lord. that Solomon had asked this thing, and God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked... For thyself long life, neither has asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Right? So God's saying, hey, you're praying for the right things. You're asking for wisdom. He's, he's humble about it. He wants the wisdom to judge. God's happy that he's asking for the most important things. Look at the next verse. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given to thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. He's saying there's nobody that will be able to compete with the wisdom that's going to come from God that he's going to give to you. Look at verse 13. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee in all thy days. Hey, seek thee first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you're seeking riches first, if you're seeking all the other things, the house, the clothes, the car, you've already failed, you've made a mistake, repent of your error, humble yourself before God and ask for some wisdom, ask for the spiritual things, and he'll take care of everything else. He'll give you everything else you need. I want you to turn to the next chapter, chapter 4. We're going to go to verse 29. So ask and it shall be given. Right in James 1 he says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. Solomon asked from God. I mean, imagine this. You're a dream. God shows up in your dream and he says, Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. What do you want? And he humbly says, Lord, I want to do the right thing as far as leading your people. Lord, I need discernment and wisdom to judge righteously. He asked to be able to judge. Think about that. Solomon wanted to be able to judge. He didn't say, well, judge not. I just Help me be real loving, Lord, right? No, I need to judge. I need to judge these things righteously, and I can't do it without your help. You know, he asked in faith, knowing that God would provide, and what God said, I have done, I have given. It's already done. It's already completed, right? And I, it's a miracle. It was a miracle. I believe Solomon was a wise guy before all this. I believe he was a smart fellow. I believe he had understanding and knowledge and all that other stuff that he was trained up in. He was raised in the scriptures. But I believe through the power of the Holy Spirit that Solomon, because especially of the foundations of the scriptures he had being raised in a godly household, that I believe all of a sudden he was able to connect dots through the power of the Holy Spirit, that before times, maybe he wouldn't have made, the, he wouldn't have connected those dots. He wouldn't have had that understanding because God worked a miracle and, and poured his spirit out and gave him some wisdom. Wisdom unlike no one else. In Matthew 7, he says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. Hey, do you want some wisdom? Ask in faith. Ask, and, it will, and you will receive. Ask, and you will get it. Seek, and you will find. Open the Bible. Seek for God's wisdom. He will give it to you. Trust His Holy Spirit to provide the wisdom and knowledge that you need. Look, you're in 1 Kings chapter 4. Look at verse number 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart even as the sand that is on the seashore. What's he saying here? Lar is, uh, God gave him understanding, right? God gave it. It's exceeding much. It's, it's more than anybody else. We already know that. But he says largeness of heart. 
Is that saying his fleshly organ was oversized? No, right? If God judges the thoughts and intents of our heart, he's talking about his mind. He's talking about the God expanded Solomon's mind. God opened up his consciousness. God gave him wisdom of supernatural things so that he could judge fleshly things. This is, again, this is a miracle. And what's it say? God gave. Again, where did it come from? Where did, where did Solomon say, I need to get it? Hey, Lord, before you, I'm just a child. Who am I? I'm nothing. I'm a peon. God says, I respect that. And asking in faith, God rewarded that. Look at verse 30. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of the, of the Egypt. The wise men from the east, he was smarter than them. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezra, the high, than He-Man, and Chalcol, and Darda, and the sons of Maol. And his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 Proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Go back to Proverbs 1. He's wiser than all men. His fame, he's renowned in all the nations. God wanted the fear of the Lord to be in all the nations, and it started with them hearing about how wise a king they had because he honored God, because he was humble before God. It says here that he had 3,000 Proverbs. Now, we only have probably about 1,000 Proverbs in the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song, Song of Solomon, from him. So there are things that... Solomon had Proverbs about earthly things and other things that God did not see fit for us to have in the Bible. It's funny because the atheist will say, well, you know, there's only, it says 3,000, but I only see 917 verses in Proverbs. Well, okay, so what? That's what God wanted us to have. God gave us what we need to have wisdom. It's in the book of Proverbs. And there's a lot of other wisdom we can find in Psalms. Hey, in Ezekiel. Hey, in Matthew, Mark. There's, there's Proverbs all throughout the Bible. Listen, a proverb is essentially the same as a dark saying, a mysterious saying. It's a parable. It's an analogy. It's an illustration. It's a picture. It's a shadow. There, there's sayings to help us connect the dots. To help. That's why when we go out soul winning, we preach the gospel, we use the, the gift illustration. Hey, if I gave you a gift. Right now, this is just pictures, salvation. We're just trying to help the, the physical human mind understand spiritual things. And God does the same thing. So a lot of the Proverbs that he gives us here are things to help us understand the spiritual meaning behind why other people do what they do and why we want the things we want and why we fail where we fail. And there's a lot of contrast that God shows us like between the fool and the wise man. There's a lot of instruction. There's a lot of, like, the, the parents, like, to a, it's written to a young man. You see him talking about a father and a mother quite a bit in Proverbs. So there's certain groundwork, there's certain terms you're going to notice as we go through that God's going to build on. And one of the biggest is the fool and the wise man. And you could say that it's easy to look at the actions and say, well, the actions of an unsaved person are what represents the fool, and the actions of, you know, the wise man would represent... The, you know, the saved person, but guess what? There are saved people that do foolish things also. So don't just look at when he talks about the fool and say, well, that's not me. You can look and say, well, that's my old flesh. That's the old man, right? That's not the new man, because there's always an application. So Proverbs chapter 1, look at verse number 2. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding... So straight out of the gate, to know. He's talking about knowledge. He's talking about wisdom. He's talking about instruction, right? Those things build on each other. You can't have wisdom without understanding. You can't have understanding without knowledge. I gave the example like a computer manual. Or God's given us you know, basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E, right? Well, here's your instruction manual. This is where the knowledge is at. You have to open it and know it. Once you know it, you'll understand what to do. And once you decide to do the right thing, that's enacting wisdom. But he says here at the tail end of this verse, he says, to perceive the words of understanding. Perception. What is perception? What does it mean to perceive something? Well, I, I perceive that, you know, Brother Joe's sitting in the back. I perceive that there's curtains on the window. I can see certain things. And as human beings, we typically have our own perception about life. And when you're having a bad day, every, your perception is everything's bad. Right? But... When you're walking in the Spirit, it doesn't matter what tries to get me down. I'm having a good day. God will give me true joy. Our perception here, though, he's talking about, is perceiving understanding. 
knowing that as we read this, that God wants us to understand certain things. So as we look at the world, the Bible says to walk circumspectly. Spect, like spectacles, right? Circle. So perceive understanding is to look around and say, I wonder why they're doing that. Lord, why are these people acting this way? Oh, it reminds me of a proverb. Oh, there's that fool that you warned me about. I perceive the words of understanding in action. I can perceive that these proverbs are coming true before my eyes. Look at the next verse here. Verse number four. I'm sorry, verse number three. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity. Right? To receive the instruction, he says. Sometimes we have to receive correction that we're doing it wrong. Sometimes we have to be judged and say, hey, you're doing that wrong. Receive it, and I'll show you how to do it right. right? A hard-headed a hard -headed person does not make a good employee because they're always right, even when they're wrong. And, and they won't fix their own problem. They won't look inside. But then at the end there, he says justice, which means to do the right. Judgment, meaning judging what you see. This is good. This is bad. This is right. This is wrong. Right? We're commanded to judge. But he says equity. Equity also means uprightness. Uprightness in heart. Upright judgment to do the right type of judgment. Are you judging equally? Do you just, well, I like this guy. He's my friend. So in this case, I'm going to pick him. Well, no, that's not right. That's not equity. Equity before God is saying, I want it to be equal to what's right according to the Bible. I want to judge righteously according to God's word. Judging righteous judgment. Look at verse 4. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Right? So now he says subtlety to the simple. Simple if you think simple-minded. This is somebody that does not have enough wisdom. He's saying this person needs some subtlety. The majority of the time the word subtlety or subtle is used in the Bible. It's used in a bad way. The devil was subtle. We'll learn later in Proverbs about the woman that's subtle in heart. And what it means is, is basically to, to be lowly or unnoticed, and a deceiver will be subtle with their intentions. If their intentions is to get into your wallet, they're not going to pronounce it to you, right? They're going to find a way through the back door and go, oh, oh yeah, do you have, can you help me out? Can you? They're going to find a way to try to deceive you. That's what the serpent did. But for a simple man, he needs some subtlety. You know, the Bible talks about a simple woman is clamorous. She's loud and She's saying things she shouldn't be saying. She needs, to be, she needs some subtlety. She needs to tone it down a notch. She needs to, to be a little more simple and not offending people with their words and actions. So here, when a simple man needs subtlety, it's a good thing. But then he says to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Discretion means uh, being, like being discreet, right? Covering it. When I think of the word discretion, I often think of a cat. Like cats or not, you know, a dog just they they put their mess on the ground a cat acts like it has some dignity and it digs a hole and tries to carry cover its own mess right it's trying to be discreet right well as far as we having discretion there's two applications one is again just like being subtle don't be so loud and boisterous tone it down a little bit you know it's always it's always the dummy that's bragging of how smart he is well i got all these gifts and talents do you really no, you don't. You know, it's the people that brag the most. You know, that, that usually have the least. But discretion all, also means having uh, the freedom of making a dis of, of, of a, the right the decision. For instance, uh, with the hymns. Well, what hymns are we singing next week, brother? I don't know. I've given them the discretion. I've given them the decision. If you will. hey, use it at your discretion. You have the freedom. But guess what? I can still override it. I can come and say, nope, we're not doing that. I don't like that. We're not doing it. So, so we've given to your discretion, right, is making a good decision. But this is not the same as discernment, what we just read about in, in the other chapter. I've actually heard, I've heard more than one pastor or preacher make the mistake of thinking discretion and discernment are the same. To discern means to judge right. Discretion means to be discreet, be low key, not offending people. Right? To just kind of tone it down. And then it also has a secondary application of, of being able to, to have freedom to do certain things. But often people get those confused, but it's important to remember discretion here is talking right along with subtlety. This same application here is tone it down, bring it down, quit being loud and boisterous, shut your mouth so you can learn something.
Think of it like that. The person that's just, they won't stop talking so they can't learn something. They need, they need some subtlety. They need some discretion in their life. Look at verse number five. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. That's the goal here. Listen, read, learn, and you will become a wise man. You will listen to the wise counsel. You will also give wise counsel. The person that listens to the Word of God and receives correction and receives understanding and knowledge from God will also attain and become wise counsel to the more simple that are looking for counsel. Look at verse number 6. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise in their dark sayings. Right? Once you have this wisdom, you'll be able to read Proverbs and get more out of it. You'll be able to read other passages of the Bible and, get, and God's Spirit will teach you things because He teaches line upon line, precept upon precept, right? Here a little, there a little. It's like building blocks. And if you don't have the basic understanding of why you need wisdom, why would He reveal to you what something in the book of Revelation means? Like, like you're, trying, you're shooting really high and God's like, let's start down here. Let's build this foundation. Right? We're going to build upon, you're a wise man, understand a proverb and the interpretation to explain what it means and how to apply it. The words of the wise and their dark sayings. Again, dark does not mean evil. It means mysterious. It's a mysterious saying. Jesus had dark sayings. They were called parables. Right here, Solomon has dark sayings. They're called proverbs. You say something to teach a lesson, and it's something you have to diligently study out. Look at verse number 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is so important. The word fear is used throughout Proverbs quite a bit. In fact, I want to I want to sort of rapidly run through Proverbs and show you a few of these. I believe it's, I believe salvation starts with the fear of the Lord. I believe our life should end with the fear of the Lord. Those that refuse to fear the Lord they're going to be afraid of their own shadow. They're going to be afraid of men and spiders and kings and captains and anything else because they've chosen not to fear God. Right? They're afraid of going to hell because they've not feared the Lord. We get wisdom, knowledge, and understanding all by fearing the Lord. So the beginning of it is knowledge. That's the first layer. You have to have knowledge. You can't just jump straight to wisdom. You've got to get the knowledge in there first. I want you to, I'm going to rapidly go through these. I'm going to announce where we're going. So if, if you want, uh, turn with me. If not, just pay attention. Proverbs chapter 2, verse number 5. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You have to understand fear and then you get knowledge. Look at Proverbs 3, verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. If you're truly afraid of God's judgment, you're going to stop Sinning. You're going to try to stop the sin in your life. You're going to obey God so you don't get corrected. Look at verse chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Look at verse number 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. So we just read the fear of the Lord is depart from evil. How do I begin to depart from evil? You ask God to hate evil. Yeah. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Well, God, I have some evil in my life. I got some wicked sin I'm doing. How do I depart from that? You ask God to help you to hate it. Amen. If you ask God to sincerely help you to hate your sin, He will help you to become victorious, to hate pride, especially in yourself, and arrogancy, the evil way in the froward mouth. Look at verse, look at 9, Proverbs chapter 9. Verse number 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You see, I say we, we build knowledge and then understanding and then wisdom. We see that especially in this chapter. The beginning of wisdom is what? Get the knowledge, understand the holy things you're reading, and then you can have some wisdom. It all starts with the fear of the Lord. Go to chapter 10. Proverbs 10, verse number 27. The fear of the Lord prolongeth the days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Listen, children, if you fear your parents, 
<laughs> you will live a long life. If you fear God and obey your parents, you will live a long life. If you break this very simple rule, God will not prolong your days. Your life will be shortened. Go to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13, 13. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Do you want to be rewarded of God? Fear the commandment. Know that it's real. If you think this, these commandments mean nothing and that they're hollow and they don't affect you and it's some fairy tale, you're not afraid of it. If you know for a fact these are the words of the living God and He will judge you by them, you better be afraid. You better know that what He says He means and He will judge you accordingly. Go to chapter 14. Proverbs 14, verse number 2. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. But he that is perverse in his ways despiseth him. What's wrong with the world? They despise the Lord. They're not afraid of him. Look at verse 16 in this chapter. Proverbs 14, 16. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. Again, departing from evil. Go to verse 26 in this chapter. Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Go to chapter 15. A fountain of life, right? These words are quick and powerful. They give life to you. Look at 15, verse 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Hey, I'd rather be broke and be afraid of God knowing that I'm not under God's curse than to have a whole bunch of stuff and be wondering when the judgment's coming. Think about it. The rich in this world, man, woe unto them one day, whether it be while they're alive or afterwards. Look at verse 33 in this chapter, Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor is humility. This is such a key verse. I want you to think about it. I'm going to read it again. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor is humility. How do I get wisdom? Be afraid of God. How do I get honor? Humble yourself before God. Humble yourself and He will lift you up. He will exalt you in due time. Go to chapter 16. Verse number 6, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Go to chapter 19, Proverbs 19, 23. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied and shall not be visited with evil. Again, if you're, if you're in God's will, Nothing can get to you that he didn't allow, and if he allowed it, he's going to get you through it, and you're going to come out stronger. You don't have to worry. Even during trials and tribulations, you need to fear the Lord and thank him for what you still have, what you do have, what matters. Look at, go to chapter 22 next. We're almost done. Proverbs 22, verse number 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Right? Remember, seek ye first the kingdom of God. How do I get all this stuff? Find God first. He'll take care of the rest. Well, I need, I need, I need. Hey, cast your cares upon Him. Be afraid that you're, you know, of obeying Him and, and Him judging you. Take care of that first, and He'll take care of the rest. He'll bless you in ways you just couldn't have even seen coming. He'll make it all work out. Look at verse... You're in chapter, what, 22, right? Yep. Go to 23... Verse 17, let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. This one's a biggie. Don't envy the sinners. Don't look at what they have. Don't look at the world and say, well, well, how come that family has this and that? And hey, you don't know, you don't know what they have. They've got strife and debt and probably, you know, all, all manner of problems that you don't even have. And I've seen people, boy, I, look at brother so-and-so's wife. You don't know what you have. 
Man, she was probably whipping, bossing him around, and he's he's feels about that big when he goes home. Be thankful for the godly woman you have, and don't look around at other people's spouses, right? Don't look around at other people's houses or spouses or or what you might perceive as physical blessings. Trust in the Lord, be afraid of Him, and He will make sure you've got everything you need. Don't envy sinners. They're not satisfied. They have no joy in their life. Yeah. That's not the standard. This is the standard. right? We don't compare ourselves amongst ourselves. If we do, that's not wise. Right. To be wise, we have to fear the Lord. Amen. Go to chapter 24. 24, verse 21. My son... Fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. All right, this is my favorite verse when Obama was running for office. He's given to change. They're holding signs that say change, right? But it also says fear the King, right? <laughs> hey, you know, he might come get us. Well, if it is, it, it is what it is, right? God's going to do what he's going to do. And, you know, Trump is just as wicked as Obama. They're both perverts. They're both destroying the country. There is no difference between the two. And anybody that thinks there is, they don't have true wisdom. They don't have fear of the Lord. They don't have understanding of the times. Look at Proverbs 31, verse 30. Last one. I love this one. How, how does he end the book of Proverbs? Talking about the fear of the Lord. How does he start the book of Proverbs? Talking about the fear of the Lord. Look at this, 31, verse 30. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Go back to Proverbs 1. Favor is deceitful, beauty is vain. There are people, it's funny, I used to live across from this guy, and we were much younger, we were friends, and this something happened, and everybody had to come out from their houses. And his mom was, was always one that had her hair done up and makeup and always dressed up like she's going to church. And, and, and there was a, an incident out in the street and all the neighbors come out and it's like, well, she doesn't have eyebrows. Man, she is ugly. Like what in the world is it? Is that your mom? What happened, man? Did somebody take a side grinder to her face? You know, she had to put war paint on every day and, and tire her head, you know? And I always remember that when I think of this, fear, you know, where he says, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. There were people that thought, oh, she's beautiful. Well, not if you really know her. <laughs> not if you actually got to meet her and know her personality, because guess what? She didn't fear the Lord. She didn't have true fear of the Lord. The outward appearance is deceptive. It's deceitful. And people, oh, well, I just love that person. Why? I don't know. Yeah, well, that's vain. That's hollow. That's empty. That's pointless. That's meaningless. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. She will be praised. That's God's promise. Look, you're in Proverbs chapter 1. Let's pick back up in verse number 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Guess what? When dad's not around, right? This is quoted in chapter 6, verse 20. It says the commandment of thy father and the law of thy mother. When dad's not home, mom's the lawgiver. That's the authority structure. Mom gives the law under dad's authority and the children need to respect her under dad's authority. They need to respect her the same way. You shouldn't be disobeying mom and then waiting for dad to get home. You need to respect mom with a fear of the Lord. Yeah. And we're going to see this a lot talking to children. And what did Solomon say? I'm just a child. He was a grown man. He was a grown adult. So listen, you say, well, I'm, I'm almost 40 years old. Who am I? Why would you call me a child? Well, maybe you're a child in understanding. Maybe you're a babe in Christ and you say, you know what? I want to learn and I'm going to humble myself as if a little child and I'm going to receive these sayings and I'm going to apply them to my life. And when I hear it talking about father and mother, I'm going to take that as the wisdom that comes from God. I'm just going to receive this instruction. Look at verse 9. It says, For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Like obeying God, it's, it's like you're going to be adorned with wisdom. It's, you know, it's like people are like, you're really glowing. You really seem smarter than you used to be. Yeah, it's because I'm reading the book of Proverbs. You know, give some credit where it's due. You know, you'll be more blessed. You'll be more spiritual when you walk in these things, and God will bless you in all aspects of your life. Verse number 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. All right, now here he shifts gears for a few verses. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Children, I want you to listen to this. He's talking about your friends. He's talking about the types of friends that you have. And it's, you know, in retrospect, all of the friends that my dad warned me about, 
there was a big problem I found out later. There are friends that today, now I know, they are a psychopath, they're a reprobate, and I didn't see it 15, 20 years ago. And my dad was saying, there's something not right with that guy. I don't want y'all hanging out. I don't want you stay, who are you with? No, I want you coming home. Oh, but dad, come on. No, come home, right? My dad set certain limitations that I despised. I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to do that. And in retrospect, I regret not respecting the wisdom that he had. Yes. Listen, parents are given a special discernment about friends that, I, that, that, that children don't have, that teenagers don't have, that young adults don't have. Even in my 20s, there were people my dad was like, I don't like that, that boss you're working for, something's not right with them. There's something wrong there. Be careful. Watch yourself. Why don't you start looking for another job? Well, dad, that's outside of your realm. I'm on my, no, I should have listened to him. I should have listened to him. I regret not listening to the wisdom and instruction from my father about friends. And here he's telling you, look, look how he says this. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. There are certain friends that when your parents warn you or the Holy Spirit says, hey, wait a minute, something's not right here, consent thou not. Don't go with them. Don't be around them. I don't care if they think you're weird or a jerk. You just need to cut them off. Yeah. You need to find some godly friends and everybody else tell them to take a hike. Yeah. Look, we minister to the world. We'll go out and get the world. We'll hang out with them to try to get them saved and, and minister to them. But, but you don't want to lump up and be friends with somebody that's unsaved or partners in business with that with somebody that's unsaved you say well, well I'm already I already have a, I already have a business well you know ask God to give you the wisdom you know it doesn't mean you have to separate in your business but if you told me tomorrow I'm starting a business and this person is unsaved I would say don't do it just don't even do it and look you know there's aspects of business you can't control sometimes your clients sometimes your vendors or who you get you know your supplies from that doesn't mean you need to go check them all out and see well is this corporation owned by a Christian or not you know what I mean look but what I'm saying is have some wisdom to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit especially as a child don't be friends with somebody that your parents warn you about you need to just take it like dad knows something I don't know and maybe in 10 years I'll figure it out until then I'll take it on faith that I just don't need to be friends with them Look how he warns you here in this. You know, look at verse number 11. He says, If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. He's saying, We're privately going to do something where we're going to get some money from somebody. We got this plan, we got this scheme. Here, come, come together. Don't tell mom and dad, but we're going to go do. Hey, when that happens, you just need to say, Red flag, there's something wrong here. Because look, Sometimes you think, that sounds really good. We'll get some money out of it. We might get uh, some toy out of it, some gaming system, some benefit somehow. But there's something here where they're actually going to get you more than they are who, the strangers. Yeah. Look, the people that get involved end up destroying themselves. Look what he says, verse 12. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Right? Hey, so-and-so is out of town. Let's go break in their house. Come on. Let's go. Nobody will find out. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to destroy yourself. Hey, we'll just take this. You caught me. Why don't you take one too? Then we'll both, we're both cool. Hey, don't do it. Walk away. Don't be involved in a situation like that. Listen. Who you lump up with. I mean, I've said it before. You either drag somebody down or you pull somebody up. Right? If you're that Christian that's dragging people down and keeping them out of church, well, I had some drama with somebody there. We're just not going to go to church. That's wicked. Amen. That is wicked. It's not right. You need to say, well, you know what? I've had my problems, but so what? They can say what they want about me. I'm going to go to church. Amen. Come on, let's go to church. Let's get on fire for God. Let's get in the Word of God. Let's grow. Look at verse 14. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. You know, you could say this is sort of like communism. There's an application for that there probably, but, you know, it makes me think more about young adults living together. And I'm not opposed to, if you're a couple single guys that are working an honest job and they're Christians, they're soul winners, and, you know, it's easier to make the bills if we work together, that's one thing. But what I am opposed to is when you start seeing these young men being pulled out of a Christian home where they don't have any bills to go live with people that are secular friends, well, we all play sports together. We all race cars together. We all play this certain game together. It, when, you're, when you're moving for selfish reasons, come on, we'll all work together. We'll all pay the bills together. We'll all, it'll, it'll be great. We'll have a good old time. You'll be out from under mom and dad. Look out, children. 
Be careful who you associate with that will destroy you. Look what he says. You've got to avoid this. Look at verse 16. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Right? Why is it saying, walk not down the way with them? Right? He says, refrain thy foot from their path. He's saying, because they're going to plot against somebody. But it's like a bird watching you set a trap. The bird's going to say, well, that's, I'm not going to go in the trap. Right? If I saw you set a trap, why would I walk into the trap? Who, who ends up in the trap? The person that set it. Who ends up hurt and destroyed? The person that lumps up with crooks. Hey, if your partner's a thief, that's bad news. Because guess what? You're going to get stolen from. Look what it says, verse 18. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. When you have people, especially young adults, that are on a path of self-destruction and, and just self-gratification, and they say, come with us. Join in with us. We'll have one purse. Come on, we'll all move in. It'll be great. Be careful. It's self-destruction. They lay wait for their own blood. They're going to destroy their lives, their credit, their flesh. Who knows what? Good. Look what it says in verse 19. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Right? Christians should not be greedy of gain. There's nothing wrong with being financially blessed, but when your number one goal is to just increase the bank account, you've already failed. You start worrying about your spiritual bank account, and God will take care of the physical bank account. He'll give you blessings you don't know about. The Bible says that you study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands. Right? That's what a Christian ought to do. Uh, if a man doesn't provide for his own, he's worse than an infidel. Somebody that won't provide, but is always trying to find some shyster of a way, some multi-level marketing scheme to get money from other people, they're going to destroy themselves. He says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, the love of money. It's not just having money, it's that desire, that lust. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. When you walk after money, you're not walking after faith. You're not walking after righteousness. You're not walking after wisdom. It says you pierce yourself. You pierce themselves through. And that's exactly what it's talking about here. When you're greedy of gain, it says it taketh away the life of the owners thereof. You're going to destroy yourself. It's self-destruction when your goals are physical and earthly. Look at verse number 20. He shifts gears again here. It says, Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. Now listen, without means outside. So imagine if you walked out the door and God's spirit of wisdom was saying, hey, you need some wisdom. Could you imagine if God would just, hey, get some wisdom. You need some understanding. You need to read your Bible. Oh, you talking to me, God? Can you imagine you wake up in the morning, you go to pour that coffee, you look over on the coffee table and there's that Bible. What's it spiritually do? Hey, open me up! Well, I gotta check my face. Open me up! I've got wisdom, I'll save your life! I'll spare you some grief! Wisdom crieth without, it says. Wisdom is yelling, it's hollering, hey! Amen. The voice is in the streets. It's everywhere, it's available. It says, she crieth, verse 21. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the openings of the gates in the city, she uttereth her words. It says, crieth and uttereth, crieth and uttereth. It says in both of those, uttering means to say something. The Bible is crying. God is saying, you need my wisdom. I'm giving it to you. It's freely available to everyone. All you have to do is search after her. Open the Bible up. You'll find it. But there's too many people that block their ears. I don't want to hear that. I'm busy. I got my own way. I got my own thing. I'm too busy to learn from God. Look, this is very dangerous. Because no one can say, well, I didn't know. I wasn't warned. It says here she's crying. Now listen, here we see wisdom sort of personified as a woman. God gives us this example. He's saying one of the attributes of God is wisdom. But he's saying God's wisdom is like a lady's, hey, you know, yelling, getting your attention. You need this. You need to read this. Softly, delicately, but loud and firm. Look at verse 22. How long, ye simple ones, 
we love simplicity. And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Wisdom is yelling at you, you fool, how long are you going to love your foolishness? You fool, how long are you going to hate God's words? Verse 23. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Wisdom is saying, turn around. Stop going in the wrong way. Turn around and you'll have the spirit of wisdom. You'll have the words of wisdom freely available. And again, this is wisdom personified, but it's also the wisdom comes from God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I love verse 23 here. One, two, three. What's it say? Turn at my reproof. Turn when I yell at you and tell you you need to change something. When you read Proverbs and you study Proverbs and it's in your heart and the Holy Spirit brings it back to your remembrance, turn at that reproof. Listen to what it's saying and then you can walk in the Spirit. You can walk and be a doer of the Word, obeying God's Word. You've got to get it in. You've got to have the knowledge. You've got to have the understanding what it means. But then when you hear it, you better answer. God's given you the, the, the formula here to become a perfect Christian, to become a complete individual that's well balanced. Now there's a, a, a parallel here a lot of people use about the reprobate doctrine, teaching that, that, that God will yell and get your attention and God wants your attention. I don't personally use Proverbs chapter 1 to teach the reprobate doctrine, but I don't have a problem using it. I don't think that you're taking away if you do. I don't personally go here. I think there's much better places to go. But there is something here where God is saying, I'm giving you a chance, I'm giving you a chance, and then you don't obey, you're going to have problems. Look at this. Remember that as we, go, as we move forward here. Verse 24, Because I have called, and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. Right? God calls you, and you refuse him. What's going to happen? Not good things, right? In Romans chapter 1, he says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Look at verse 25. But ye have said it not, all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. Not means nothing. You've, you've taken what I've given you and you said it's nothing. I don't want it. I don't want none of it, he said. And would none of my reproof. You didn't want any of what I've offered you. you didn't, you've none my reproof. Jeremiah 6, he says, Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened to my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. You didn't want the wisdom that God's giving you. You reject it. God will reject you. In the same way with wisdom, and again, I do believe there's, you can use Proverbs 1 to teach the doctrine. There are people that it's too late for, but it's also, I think you could apply it to the Christian life. Hey, Christian, you're in sin. You refuse to get it right. God may kill you. He may destroy your flesh, right? Your soul's going to be delivered. He may deliver such a one unto Satan, right? A sin unto death. It is possible for Christians to reject the wisdom of God and destroy their own life physically and die early without reward. Look at verse 26. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when the distress and anguish come upon you, then shall they call upon me. But I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. You think about, hey, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Thank God you've done it today. You've done it in, in this life because there are people that will get to eternity and they're going to bow their knee. Oh, they're going to confess and it's going to be too late. God is going to cast them into the lake of fire forever. There, some of them are in hell already right now and they're saying, no, Lord, I'm sorry. Give me another chance. He said, no, it's too late. You had your chance while you were alive. There are people that become rejected of God because they refuse His wisdom. There are Christians that will refuse correction from the Word of God and God will destroy their physical life. God will correct them in the flesh and then bring them home to heaven. Look at verse 29. For that they hated knowledge 
and did not choose the fear of the Lord. That's our world today. They hate knowledge. They do not choose the fear of the Lord. Notice he said, I'll laugh when your fear cometh. When your fear comes, why? Because you didn't fear the Lord. If you would only fear the Lord, you wouldn't have to fear through tribulation and trials. In Romans 1, he says, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. There's coming a time for everybody where we're, we're going to see a, a bigger division through the Word of God. It, it may be happening to you right now in your life. It may be happening at work or in your family. The Word of God divides people. It is a sword. It separates the room. I mean, literally, if you're in a room full of 30 people you don't know, and you start talking about God, you're, you're gonna, boy, you're going to separate that room real quick, yeah. right? Just as much when somebody comes in and they're not saved, it's real obvious when you start talking to them. They don't know the Word of God. Look at verse 32 here. Actually, back up, I'm sorry, verse 30. They would none of my counsel. They despised my reproof. Therefore... Shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices? Right? In Romans he says, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Means sufficient. Right? Meat means that's what you deserve. You're getting your just desserts. AIDS. VD, STD, whatever alphabet you want to talk about, right? When people go against the will of God, guess what? God judges their flesh. Amen. And it's just a, a precursor of what would happen to their soul. Yep. In Romans 1, he says, Who knowing the judgment of God, and they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. When he says filled with their own devices, he's saying, you know what you deserve for what you're doing, and that's why they're afraid of judgment. That's why they fear even a Christian. If a Christian in here said, man, I, I've been messing up, I've been fornicating, I've been drinking, I've been going down the wrong road, I've been forsaking church, I know the judgment's coming. If it's not already here, it's on its way. I'm going to get it right, I'll get in church. Get in church. Don't tell me you're going to get in church. Get in church before God destroys your physical life. Yeah. Don't hearken to the voice of a stranger. Don't listen to some fool that would say, don't go back that way. Come on, stay with us. Come with us. Don't do it. Look at verse 32. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. You know... The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Some rich people, their big bank account is exactly why they're going to go to hell or exactly why their family's destroyed. It's because they chose things instead of God. They, they chose stuff instead of salvation. On this note, I want you to go to Psalm 73. Hold your finger here. We'll be right back. Psalm chapter 73. Rejecting biblical wisdom will destroy you. And when he says here, the turning away of the simple shall slay them. Look, there are simple Christians that turn away from the walk that God has called you to. I've seen it in Fort Worth with certain people that they move there, they get excited, they get on fire for God. And guess what? I, 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 I thought they were smart. I thought they were wise people. In retrospect, they were simple because they turned away from wisdom. They turned away from serving God. And I saw their whole life totally destroyed. It was their choice. Like, salvation is a choice. Your daily walk is a choice. If you turn away, the Bible says it's like you're a simple-minded man instead of being a wise man. Right. Becoming wise starts with the fear of the Lord. Be afraid of turning away from the walk that God has you in. Be afraid of turning aside and not going to church. You're in Psalm 73. Find verse number 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He's saying he's overwhelmed. Look at verse 3. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You understand? He's saying, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I was overwhelmed. I'm stumbling. This guy is stumbling because he's saying, well, how come the rich people are prospering? How come the evil people are being blessed? What's going on? Things are out of balance. Look what he says, verse 4. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. Man, they've got everything under control. They've got everything in the world, right? They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride 
compass them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. How come these rappers on TV are getting away with whatever they want? They're being accused of murder and they're walking around free. They got millions of dollars and they don't even pay taxes. And they're proud about it. They're boasting. They got the world, right? You say, look, did they make a deal with the devil? How are they able to prosper in being wicked? Look what he says, verse 7. Their eyes stand out with fatness. That means healthy. In the Bible, fat means healthy, all right? Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They don't care about the poor people. They got so much stuff, they, they probably waste more money in a day than you make in a year. They got more stuff. All, all these kids are growing up looking at these people as heroes. They got all, Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus. They're making them idols. Oh, they got more stuff than heart could desire. What's going on? They're wicked. They hate God. They're promoting wickedness. Why are they being blessed? This man of God is saying, Lord, I don't understand what's going on here. Look what, look what he says, verse 9. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. They, they can say whatever they want and get away with it. They even speak against God, and lightning doesn't destroy them. Right? Like Conor McGregor says he'd beat up Jesus if he met him. Hey, I look forward to the day when that man has a heart attack or he wrecks, and, wrecks a, a vehicle into a tree or whatever, however God gets him, right? I pray it would be a lightning bolt, so it would be supernatural. People would say, oh yeah, God finally got him. But look what he says. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? But he said, well, how come, isn't God judging them? What's going, is God going to get these people or what? Look at verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Right? He's talking about the prosperity of the wicked. That's what we read in, in, in Proverbs. That's how he starts out this psalm. What, how, what, why is there such a thing as prosperity of the wicked? Why does that even add up? I mean, I thought God gave us all things, right? The blessings. Look at verse 13. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain. And washed my hands in innocency. He begins to question himself. I'm broke. My car don't run right. My family's messed up. This guy's got everything he wants and he curses God. He's clearly wicked. He's working for the devil. Why does he have stuff and I'm having problems? Right? He's questioning, am I serving God for no reason? Why are these people blessed? Look, verse 14. For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. Hey, you're chastened because you're not a bastard. Verse 15, if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He's saying, this is some heavy thoughts. Well, I don't understand why all this is happening. Verse 17, here's the answer. Until I went until the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. You know, I go to the house, I see all this wickedness in the world, I see them prospering in the world and oppressing us, but I go to the sanctuary of God, I hear the word of God, I hear the wisdom of God, then I remember their end. It's called the lake of fire. Amen. Fire and brimstone, torture forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night. Hey, you can have the riches now. I'll, t I'll enter into the rest of God Almighty. Look what he says, verse 18. Surely... Thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. Go back to, to Proverbs chapter 1. Hey, when you see the prosperity of the wicked, don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged. When you see evil, wicked people doing stuff in public and not getting judged for it, don't worry about it. Commit it to God. He'll righteously judge they may go to hell because of their hatred for him and of you. And for you, just say, you know what? I understand their end. I see the wisdom of God. Verse 32, he said, For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Look at verse 33. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Quiet from fear of evil. You have nothing to worry about. There is no fear in your life. Well, I don't know. We're going through a tough t situation. 
I didn't ask for permission, but I'll use Brother Doug. He says, you know what? We're going we're gonna to do a home birth, and we're going to do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to trust God to provide. Well, but don't you, aren't you afraid? What, what would happen without a doctor? What would happen without a hospital? Well, don't you need to pay somebody? Say, yeah, well, you know what? God will provide. And guess what? God provides. Amen. And listen, when you have this attitude, well, I don't know what we're going to do. We've got, X, we've got to pay $900, and I don't have any money in the bank account, and we're broke. And I don't, hey, trust God. Don't fear the bills. Don't fear the job. Don't fear the doctor. Fear God Almighty. Amen. Listen. Just, just the miracle of birth in itself, whether it's in a hospital or at home, your fear needs to be of God. Your trust and your confidence needs to be in God, and He'll provide. He'll provide. He's going to bring those babies. Look, it's up to us as Christians to fear God, and then we don't have to fear harm. Look, go back to verse number 7, where we started. Proverbs 1, verse number 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction just about anything you need in your Christian life it begins with the fear of the Lord the fear of the Lord is the beginning to a great Christian life let's pray Lord God thank you for your word thank you for the book of Proverbs Lord I pray that you would help us to be fruitful as we learn this Lord help us to understand Lord I pray you would open up our hearts and our minds to change the things we need to Lord I pray that you would just bless this church with more wisdom and understanding to judge. Lord, we trust you to give us wisdom. It's all from you. You give us our breath. You give us our, our conscience. And Lord, we're asking you in faith to give us wisdom. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.